and the principles that the Buddha taught to his stepmother, Mahabhajapati Gautami, on how to distinguish what is Dharma and Vinaya and what is not. There are three that have to do with how your practice affects other people. The first is that genuine Dharma leads to modesty. In other words, you don't go bragging about your attainments or about how much you know. Because after all, the Dharma has nothing to do with what other people think of you. They don't need to know what you're doing, because after all, the big problem is your problem. The way you're causing suffering for yourself. And if you're able to make practice in that area, fine. If you have something to share with others, you share it in a way where you're not bragging. You try to stay modest. But it's a general rule, especially in the forest tradition, that you don't go around talking about your attainments. And John Fuhrman got scolded by John Mun one time, and he had gone to stay with the John Mun. And he was able to check out the devas and the different hills around there, and apparently he would mentioned something to one of the other monks. And as John Mun said, what you see in your visions is your business. It's meant for you, not for anybody else. What you learn in your practice, what comes up in your practice, if you want to talk about it to somebody, talk about it to your teacher, because the teacher is there to help you. But if you talk about it with others, you've got several problems. One is you have to ask yourself, what is your motivation for telling those other people? You have to look into that. The other is that they may give you some misinformation. They may have their ideas about what you're doing, which may or not may not be reliable. And if it turns out it is a psychic power of some kind, if the word gets out, you don't have much peace. There's that story with John Lee visiting that one woman up in the northern part of Thailand. He was on his way through. And a monk had come earlier and checked her out. She had been paralyzed for many years. And the monk told him, well, I can't help you, but a forest monk is going to come, and he'll be able to help. So John Lee was the next forest monk that came through the area. So the women's children went to see him and asked if he could come and sort of check out the situation, see if he might be of some help to her. As he tells the story, he walked in the house, and already she was able to get up, move a little bit. Enough to why him. And then within a day or two, she was totally cured. But immediately the word got out, and people were bringing jars and jars of water for him to bless, so he realized he had to get out of there. There's a similar story in the canon. Jitta, the householder, has invited a number of monks to his house for a meal. And on the way back, it's a hot day. And this is, Polly says that. They walked along as if they were melting. And the junior most monk asked the senior most monk, wouldn't it be nice to have a little rainstorm right now with a bit of breeze and a few drops of water to cool us down? And the senior monk said, yes, that would be very nice. So all of a sudden this rainstorm comes up, cooling breeze, just a few drops of water. And they get back to the monastery and the junior monk says, okay, is that enough? And the senior monk said, yes, that's, that was very nice of you. And they go back to their huts. Well, Jitta had been following them, and he saw this. So after the monks had gone back to their huts, he went to that monk, Mahaka, and said, I saw what you did. Can you do anything else? Mahaka said, okay, take your upper robe off, put it on the porch here, and put a pile of grass on top of it. So Jitta did that. The Mahaka went into the hut, and all of a sudden this flame came out through the cracks around the door, consumed all the grass but left the cloth. 
Then the flames died down. Mahaka came out. Jitta was shaking out his robe, and his hair was standing on end. Mahaka said, is that enough? And Jitta said, that's plenty. And if you need any food, clothing, shelter, or medicine, just let me know. You can stay on here as long as you like. Mahaka said, that was very nice of you to say that. And as soon as Jitta leaves, Mahaka gets his stuff and packs it up and leaves. Because he knows there's going to be trouble. Either there'll be jealousy from the other monks, or the world will Excuse me, the word would get out to the lay people, and other people would want to come and see his powers. So if you have something special like that, keep it under wraps. Our problem here is people have nothing nearly that special, but they like to show, it off, show off whatever they've got, especially if they've been online and read a lot of things and had lots of ideas. We've had many quote-unquote Johns come through. You have to realize the reason we're reading the Dharma, the reading of studying the Dharma, is to cure our own defilements. It's an internal job. Other people don't have to know. And as John Lee once said, the things that other people do know about are not safe. But the noble attainments are totally internal, as we chant every day, Pachatang Wedi Tabo when you eat to be known individually by the, by the observant for themselves. So being quiet about, quiet about what's going on in your practice is a good thing. There's that story in the Taragata about a novice. The Buddha sees the novice and he points him out to Sarabhuta. He says, see that novice over there? Sorry, Buddha says, yes, okay. He's a novice studying under Anuruta. And every day he levitates to the Himalayan mountains and washes his teacher's bowl in a lake there. And his predominant thought is, let nobody find out about me. That's the kind of attitude you should have as a practitioner. People don't have to know. And this is directly related to one of the internal qualities that we develop in the practice, which is Shedding, shedding your pride. Shedding the need to look good in the eyes of others. If you have something really good inside, it's good enough in and of itself. Awakening is its own reward. The skills you develop in terms of concentration, insight, they're their own reward. Nobody else has to know. The second quality that affects other people is not getting entangled. You've spent a lot of your time involved in the issues of other people. You don't have much time to practice. This is directly related to the internal quality of persistence, because you've got a lot of unskillful qualities in your mind that you've got to sort out. And the more you get entangled with other people, the less time you have. And even when you do have duties that involve other people, you learn how to have a sense of just right. The Buddha had some nice praise for Ananda one time, saying that Ananda would teach lay people. And they would delight in listening to what he had to say. And he never spoke so much that they got tired of listening to him. In fact, he would always stop before they felt they'd had enough. He wouldn't drone on and on and on. And this principle applies to conversations. If you have conversations with others, okay, deal with what has to be dealt with. And stop there. Our problem is when we start talking and one topic leads to another, leads to another, it's like a, a chain that we make. We keep forging new links, new links, and then of course who gets bound up by the chain? We do. So if you want to have time to do your practice, you've got to learn how to deal with people 
in such a way that you take care of what needs to be taken care of, speak enough so that people are in good terms, and then just drop the topic, cut things off. And John Fuin was very good at this. He always wanted to hear more from him. But he had a very clear sense of how much was enough, which usually is a lot less than the enough that people are not practicing. And one of his rules of thumb was, if something is not necessary, why say it? So that should be one of your questions. We have the questions from the Buddha. Is it true? Is it beneficial? Is it the right time and place? And you can add a John Fuhrman. Is it necessary? That cuts through a lot of idle chatter right there. And finally, there's a the principle of being unburdensome. As monks, we do have to depend on lay people. After all, we can't handle money. And there's a reason for that. As the Buddha said, anyone for whom money is okay, the five strings of sensuality are okay. If you're out there handling money, buying things on your own, there's no control over what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. You can get anything. And so we do have to depend on lay people. So we want to make sure that you place as little of a burden on them as possible. This relates directly to the internal quality of contentment. If you have enough food, clothing, shelter, and medicine, okay, you've got enough. Don't sit around thinking about what more you would like to have. I've heard some people complain that like, the fact that monks don't handle money is a burden on the lay people. But again, think about not only the the appropriateness of this, given their practice, but also the whole question of people are handling money, sometimes starting amassing funds, and then they're very much in control of the funds and issues in con communities where people are holding on to the money can drive the community apart. So it's good that we have these rules around money. And for what little burden they place on people, we have to make sure that we're not asking for money from people. And it's interesting, when the Buddha talked about placing burdens on people, say when you're building a hut, it's always the burden of things that they would have to buy, or the burden of too many requests. By requesting a little bit of assistance, that's part of being a human being. So that doesn't come under being burdensome. It's only when you make a lot of requests of people, okay, then it becomes a burden. Right? That they have to shell out extra money. That's a burden. So you have to be very careful, try to be, develop as much contentment as you can. And it's in this way that your practice is in line with the Dharma. Because these external qualities, as I said, relate to internal ones. Modesty relates to shedding. Unentanglement relates to putting an effort into the practice. Being unburdensome relates to contentment. And all these qualities that we're developing are for the sake of freedom. Some people think their freedom lies in showing off to other people. Freedom in having as many friends as possible, as many activities with their friends as possible. Freedom in being able to impose on others. Okay, that's freedom in the world, and it's, a, it's an every image, very immature freedom. The Buddha is looking for a different kind of freedom, freedom that comes inside. And it's going to involve developing qualities outside that place restraint on us. 
but that simply focuses our attention where it should be focused. If there's restraint on how you behave outside, you have to turn around. If you're going to find true happiness, you've got to look inside. So these restraints are for the sake of freedom. And the more you appreciate that, and the more you act in line with that, the more freedom you'll find. <laughs>